And today it's a great pleasure to have Herbert Schiller as um, our speaker. But before we introduce him and before he starts, I wanted to um, give you a couple of announcements um, regarding the seminar series and also the upcoming uh, lectures. So the first one is a reminder about the Lifetime Conference 2.0. Um, there's still uh, the possibility to register and it's gonna take place on 16th, 17th of June. So uh, if you want to attend, please register um, soon. And the second is um, about our next uh, upcoming lecture. And this is going to be on July the 2nd and it's gonna be by Simon Haas from the MDC in Berlin. So if you're interested, um, put it in your calendars. And now um, just a couple of reminders. Um, yes, exactly. So the next, um, the next, our today's speaker. <laughs> so uh, this, our today's speaker is Herbert Schiller and I'm just gonna introduce him quickly and then I'm gonna give you a couple of reminders about um, uh, how to ask your questions. So Herbert um, uh, did his PhD in the Medical University of Vienna. And uh, then he did uh, two postdocs. One was in the MPI of biochemistry in Mini uh, with Reinhard Fessler. And then the second one was also in the same place at the MPI for biochemistry in Mini, but now with Matthias Mann. And since uh, 2015, he has his own independent group leader position at the Helmholtz Center in Mini at the Institute for Lung Biology and Disease. And um, yeah, and with that, I'm really excited about what Herbert is going to tell us today. Um, so with that, just two quick reminders. So if you have questions, uh, then pre please raise your hand on, um, uh, on Zoom uh, or uh, write your question in the chat. And the second reminder is that uh, um, the lecture will be recorded on YouTube. So with that, um, without any further ado, uh, Herbert, the scene is yours. All right. Thank you, Boyan, uh, Boyan, for the nice introduction and good morning, everybody. Uh, you can see my screen? Yes. All right. Yes, so uh, today, wait a second, I need to move this away. Um, <clears throat> today I will talk uh, to you about our discovery of a, a particular stem cell intermediate in lung regeneration that we think plays an important role in the pathophysiology of lung fibrosis. And then in the second part of uh, my presentation, I will discuss with you how we can analyze the correspondence of protein biomarkers in body fluids with uh, cell state changes in the tissue. So, Wait a sec. Uh, okay, so my lab is particularly interested uh, in lung fibrosis, and you can think of that as sort of a failed regenerative response. So the tissue is locked in repair in kind of a chronic state. And if it comes to the lung, <clears throat> uh, when there is uh, injury of the epithelium, uh, we have, uh, we know that there is uh, distinct different types of stem cell populations uh, in the kind of pro proximal airways different types of stem cells in the distal airways. And uh, in particular, the alveolar space, of course, is uh, essential for breathing. So you have the gas exchange happening where a very specialized ultra thin epithelial cell in the alveolus called the type one epithelial cell. And it's very well known and backed by lineage tracing studies that the main stem cell in the alveolus is the surfactant producing type two epithelial cell. So in case of uh, injury, Type two cells can differentiate, uh, flatten out and give rise to type one cells. In cases of very severe injury, such as H1N1 influenza infection, for example, when all the type two cells locally are wiped out, it has been shown that distal airway stem cells can immigrate and also participate in alveolar regeneration. So if these processes go wrong for whatever reason, mostly unknown, uh, the lung can scar up permanently and also there's many, um, there's clinical entities where you have progressive scarring of the <coughs> lung parenchyma, uh, in particular idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In fact, there is more than 200 clinical entities known of lung fibrosis, so a lot of uh, heterogeneity and also on the histopathological side, we know that there's different types of patterns. Um, and uh, importantly, this is also one of the most um, uh, severe long-term complications, most likely that we will see with the COVID-19 
patients. So we really want to understand uh, uh, what leads to permanent fibrosis in the lung. And uh, in order to uh, do this, we need to study what is happening in normal lung regeneration. Uh, in the mouse model, we can have longitudinal settings. And actually, when, uh, when we induce acute lung injury uh, in mice using bleomycin, we know that in the course of eight weeks, the uh, epithelium can fully regenerate it regenerate and also the transient fibrogenic response uh, in this process, which is probably needed for regeneration, uh, completely remodels back to normal. Uh, we had sort of a, um, a very systematic view into this with uh, uh, two experiments, one where we uh, surveyed the entire mouse lung at eight time points of the injury, and another one where we did a very high resolution sampling of the lung epithelium at 18 time points of the injury. So we analyzed uh, gene expression dynamics, cell cell communication, and uh, cellular trajectories, and discovered uh, a novel transitional stem cell state that appears. Uh, and so I will briefly discuss with you some of the key findings of this paper. So uh, to have a high resolution of the epithelium, we uh, sorted uh, EPCAM positive cells and analyzed them at 18 time points after injury. Uh, so in this very high resolution data set, uh, we detected all the uh, expected epithelial cell identities, including rare populations such as the basal cells and neuroendocrine cells. Uh, and in the alveolar space, you can see that we detect uh, type two cells. So the surfactant producing kind of round cuboidal cell and type one cells, the ultra flat cells covering the capillaries. And then we saw two injury-induced states, so sort of an activated state of the 82 cells and the cluster, which we didn't really know of. It was characterized by very high expression of keratin-8. Uh, and in immunofluorescence validation, you can clearly see that uh, in, in, the, in the normal healthy lung, keratin-8 is only highly expressed in airways. However, after injury, we can see these keratin-8 high cells all over the place, also in the alveolar space. And importantly, this is a transient event. So that's quantified here from the immune fluorescence. The appearance of these cells peaks at day 10 and then goes, goes back uh, to baseline in the course of uh, the following weeks. Uh, performing 3D morphometry showed us that we can essentially see three populations <clears throat> here. So um, co-staining with the marker for type two cells, so surfactant protein C and, and this keratin-8, we can see round uh, cuboidal type two cells shown in red here. And then these white cells would be the, the type one cells. And then type one cells are gone after injury. They are sort of replaced by these green cells in uh, the keratin-8 cells. And so the, the cells that have a little bit of uh, keratin-8 already at higher levels and still the uh, surfactant protein C expression are already a little bit flatter than the um, keratin-8 high cells that lost expression of uh, surfactant protein C are already very flat. So we interpret this as a, a continuous differentiation process. And so now we could see that actually before preceding this type 1 identity, we have now this uh, novel intermediate state. Uh, in the single cell analysis, um, um, uh, sort of we can look for receptor ligand pairs, and that's shown here. So if we quantify the cell-cell communication uh, uh, capacity of these cells, we can see that after injury, they, they seem to have uh, mostly receptor ligand pairs with macrophages, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. And uh, importantly, this is very distinct to the, uh, to the other cell identities. So here is an example. I'm showing you the connectome with end endothelial capillaries uh, and comparing the type of ligand that is sent by either these intermediate uh, alveolar differentiation intermediates or the terminal 81 cells. And you can clearly see that this is very different. For instance, the endothelin ligand expressed by keratin-8 cells uh, has a receptor the endothelium receptor on the capillaries, and this is normally not expressed in the in the healthy ground state uh, in the in the AT1 cells. So more generally, uh, these ADI cells specifically express many secreted factors that are, are already known to be involved in fibrosis. fibrosis so pro-fibrogenic -fibros molecules, 
And uh, very interestingly, we could see a, a strong enrichment for a P53 DNA damage repair signature in this intermediate. Uh, we also see a very strong enrichment for a cellular senescence signature. So this could be something like a transient uh, regenerative senescence uh, that the cells undergo. And also previous, many previous reports uh, speculated about epithelial mesenchymal transition uh, in, in uh, lung injury repair. And we can show that these cells express many of these factors that are normally associated with EMT. So we don't have a true EMT here, but we have features of EMT in these cells. And uh, so together, all of that suggests that uh, these uh, cells actually may be pro-fibrogenic in, in the sense that they can activate uh, fibroblasts uh, and maybe uh, promote the myofibroblast transition. Uh, when we then had a look at the um, uh, cellular origins uh, using RNA velocity, <clears throat> uh, you can see here that surprisingly, not only the 82 cells were predicted to be a cellular source for these keratin-8 cells, but also, <clears throat> um, excuse me, also um, an, an airway population, a subpopulation uh, of the airway club cells. So in fact, um, using the <clears throat> RNA velocity, we were able to uh, model this in pseudo time. So you can see here the terminal state likelihood derived from uh, two clusters. So the activated 82 cells and a subset of the airway club cells. And we can see that key um, transcriptional regulators of distal, um, epithelial, distal lung epithelial cell identity were actually downregulated in this process. So we can see a transcriptional convergence of two different types of stem cells onto this novel alveolar differentiation intermediate. And then many factors uh, are upregulated in this process, including SOX4. So here we have candidate transcriptional regulators um, that could play a role in this process. Uh, we were able to confirm this with uh, uh, the dual origin of these cells uh, using tra traditional lineage tracing. Uh, so in this quantification here, you can see um, uh, we used uh, SPC, surfactant protein C, uh, Cree-ER mice uh, to lineage trace the type 2 cells, and SOX2 Cree-ER mice to lineage trace all the airway cells. And approximately half of the uh, alveolar differentiation intermediates after injury were either derived from 82 cells or airway cells. So this confirms uh, what the single cell analysis has shown us. Of course, with the single cell resolution, we can model gene expression in a pseudo time. And we were able to also show that these alveolar differentiation intermediates indeed uh, uh, seem to terminally differentiate into 81 cells in the time course. So in particular, in the later time points of this, uh, uh, so these are the real time points of sampling. Um, we can see uh, uh, that these RNA velocity vectors point uh, towards the 81 cells. And then uh, um, in, in the pseudo time uh, fit, we can then model gene expression in the process and identify important uh, consecutive steps of uh, pathway activation. Uh, so in summary, what, um, what we have found here is that uh, there is a, a kind of a transcriptional convergence of two different types of stem cells into this novel intermediate that features pro-fibrogenic uh, gene expression. And importantly, this is a transient uh, process in normal lung regeneration. However, what we also saw is that uh, if we compare that to uh, end-stage uh, lung fibrosis in human patients, so this is comparing to a uh, single cell uh, human analysis, and there was recently described uh, a novel uh, disease-specific cell state called the aberrant basaloid cell in human lung fibrosis. And we could show that these cells are actually the most similar to um, uh, the cells we discovered in the mouse. So in fact, they're, they're actually very similar in their transcriptional profile. And we were also able to sort of identify in human lung sections uh, that uh, <clears throat> these intermediates appear uh, both after acute lung injury. So this is an ARDS patient uh, who died of influenza A infection or in chronic uh, idiopathic pul pulmonary fibrosis. So you can see this keratin-8 high cells appearing, uh, which is not the case in the healthy control lungs. 
And this um, nicely has also been confirmed now in the COVID-19 setting. So in these two uh, recently published nature papers, both studies actually discuss and describe the appearance of these uh, intermediate cells between 81 and 82. Um, and so they also compared uh, the signatures to, to uh, what, what we described. Uh, and um, so this seems to be very similar and, and therefore confirming that also in the human acute injury setting, these cells can appear. So this is leading us to uh, this um, kind of research framework. What, what I have shown you is that in normal physiological lung regeneration, we can see the appearance of regenerative intermediate cell states. And importantly, these cell states appear transiently. So what we think is happening is uh, the cell state or the, the cells uh, reach a point in space and time where they actually encounter molecular checkpoints. Uh, if the checkpoint uh, uh, is uh, passed, uh, cells and actually the entire cell circuit can move on into the next phase of the process. And so I would propose that uh, in, in chronic disease, uh, these uh, checkpoints are uh, defective. So there is, um, which, which could actually lead to the persistence and accumulation of these regenerative intermediate cell states. So what we uh, want to understand in the future is how, uh, how are these uh, different checkpoints uh, um, uh, changed in disease and aging process. So the checkpoints could be the cell intrinsic, uh, such as DNA damage repair pathways, uh, or in the tissue niche uh, in the cell-cell communication space. So the hope is if we better understand these checkpoints, we can therapeutically induce a regenerative outcome. Uh, if this graph looks, so this um, image looks familiar to you, that's most likely because of uh, uh, the, the lifetime uh, white paper. And so um, uh, you, probably many of you uh, know that the, the, the key objective of the lifetime initiative, initiative is uh, to derive this cell-based interceptive medicine in the future where we can have a a very early detection of the disease process in the patient. Uh, and, and the proposal is to, to quantify digitalized trajectories and, and, and derive this from different types of uh, multimodal single cell analysis in combination with artificial intelligence uh, and, uh, analysis. And we hear a lot about cell trajectories and we are kind of accustomed to look at these cellular trajectories. However, uh, if you think about what this means, uh, this necessarily has to refer to something like a tissue state. And that is uh, also on the computational side, it's not very well developed to really uh, analyze in, in such a kind of tra trajectory sense uh, an entire tissue state. And <clears throat> uh, for a future cell-based interceptive medicine, of course, we will need uh, also ways of monitoring this uh, uh, with biomarkers. So in fact, the tissue state uh, and the, the state of the tissue niche determines cell identity. So we know that cells influence each other and uh, in the tissue context, uh, uh, we have different types of multicellular circuits and it's, it's not really understood uh, how these cells influence each other, how they feedback with their own extracellular matrix. And on the gene level, uh, many genes most likely did not only evolve to support the individual function of one individual cell type, but they also evolved to support the function of the entire cell circuit. So if we want to understand what uh, changes in disease, um, we have to also understand how individual genes that uh, are maybe only expressed in one particular cell type can affect the entire uh, cell circuit. And so it will be important to really compare multicellular gene programs and not only compare the, the profile, profile of one particular cell type across different uh, stages of the disease. And uh, what, what I will talk in the remainder of this presentation is how can we understand the sort of correspondence and representation of these cell state and cell circuit uh, uh, state changes in the disease tissue with peripheral biomarkers so that we can really sort of uh, in a non-invasive way uh, monitor what's happening in the in the patient. 
Uh, and we, we made a first, first attempt in this direction in this paper where we combined uh, in a sort of multimodal analysis, uh, mass spec based uh, protein quantification in, in patient body fluids. So we looked into bronchial uh, velar lavage, which is uh, very close to the diseased organs, uh, organ and uh, blood plasma and integrated this with uh, three independent cohorts of single cell RNA-seq profiling of uh, human lung fibrosis. We identified protein biomarker signatures uh, and then uh, also could show how they correspond uh, with the cell state changes. So first of all, we wanted to have a very good uh, sort, of st uh, sort of statistical analysis of the gene expression changes in disease. And in order to do so, we uh, uh, integrated three independent cohorts. So we had our own study in Munich and then two published studies from Chicago and uh, Nashville. Um, and by integrating the three data sets, we ended up with uh, more than 30 controls and end-stage uh, fibrosis samples with more than 230,000 cells. And looking at the cell annotations over here and the uh, um, cohort identity over here, you can see that uh, actually the integration worked nicely. So uh, the, the cell type identity dominates in this uh, UMAP embedding, and we were able to uh, nicely assign the cell identities and then perform uh, uh, statistical analysis across all three cohorts. And we found very good reproducibility of the individual cohort results. Uh, so for instance, uh, looking at the cell type frequency changes, uh, we can see that already only the, the cell type frequency in this um, principal component analysis of the frequencies shown here. And then you have uh, the cohorts marked with these different shapes. And the control samples are up here. And in principal component two, we can already see a separation to disease. And that's the same in all three cohorts. In fact, if we train a random forest with the uh, cell type frequency, this already has a very good prediction accuracy in predicting uh, the disease uh, state. And uh, the most, uh, and random forest importance score can show us which cell identities were most important for these predictions. Uh, and uh, interestingly, again, this aberrant basaloid cell, which I have shown you, is very similar to this uh, alveolar differentiation intermediates that we discovered in the mouse, are um, uh, scoring very high uh, in predicting the disease uh, status. So uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a progressing disease. It starts in the periphery and then uh, progresses to the center of the lung. And in any patient, even if in the very end stage patient, you still find areas of the lung which look rather normal uh, histologically. So that's shown here in this paper, the authors used micro CT staging to uh, stage um, within patient into these, four uh, into these three groups. So very early disease on the histological level, intermediate and very progressed scarring. And they actually derived uh, bulk transcriptomic data sets, which we could use now uh, with the single cell uh, modality to, uh, for a deconvolution analysis. And what we find is very interesting. So the, these aberrant basaloid cells and also myofibroblasts that uh, are sort of the, the culprits to mediate fibrosis, they already appear in this very early stage, sort of preceding the very uh, strong collagen-based remodeling of the tissue. So um, this indicates that in this, uh, in this zone, we already have these uh, cellular changes ongoing. <clears throat> uh, then we had performed also uh, this bronchial velar lavage protein fluid proteome analysis. And this is actually mostly done um, in initial diagnosis of uh, the disease. So uh, some of the patients are sort of in an early stage. And uh, this is during bronchio bronchioscopy um, when the clinician flushes some fluid into the lung, they can uh, sort of collect that fluid and uh, we can spin down the cells and then only analyze the fluid phase. So the soluble proteins, uh, and we identified around 1,000 proteins per sample for 128 patients here. 
and then also had uh, more than 30 different clinical parameters for these patients and uh, including uh, lung function. And we uh, combined all these different lung functions parameters into one meta lung function and accounted for gender and age in the study. And you can see across these 128 patients here, we, can, we have patients with rather good lung function and we have patients that already have a very uh, severely reduced lung function. So this is sort of a pseudo progression across all these individual samples. Uh, uh, we performed a multivariate um, um, uh, regression analysis, uh, correcting for age and gender here. And then we can identify proteins that correlate with a good lung function in the, in the body fluid, lavage fluid proteome, and proteins that correlate with a reduced lung function. And uh, so this is a bulk sample. We can now use the single cell modality to perform a deconvolution. So here you can see the kind of distribution of all the proteins we detect, uh, how they correlate uh, with the lung function, and then certain cell type signatures. So I'm showing you here uh, as an example, the myofibroblasts and plasma cells that we know are enriched and increased in frequency in, in the disease. They are indeed, uh, correlating with a negative lung function. So they are enriched for, uh, um, they, they are contributing to this um, uh, negative lung function enriched proteins more. Uh, we also compared um, these proteomic lung function regression with the single cell gene expression changes and scored uh, which cell types contribute, seem to contribute most to the uh, proteins in, in the fluid. And uh, this is mostly epithelial uh, cell identities. So now to understand whether the, the protein features that we measured uh, really can predict uh, the disease uh, status, uh, also in the transcriptomic uh, data modality, we trained the random forest with the protein features and then used it on the single cell and bulk mRNA uh, data modalities. And indeed, <clears throat> we can predict um, reduced lung function in all the three single cell uh, data cohorts. But more importantly, what we can predict is a, a, a progressive reduction in lung function in this uh, staged bulk uh, RNA-seq data set. Um, really showing that uh, the protein features that we detected by correlating with lung function uh, can now also uh, um, predict um, a gradual reduction in this uh, stage trans transcriptomic data. Um, so in the end, I will show you uh, two examples of such predictive protein features. Uh, one is negatively correlated with lung function, and the other one is positive, uh, uh, positively correlated with lung function. So the, the CFHR1 protein was interested, interesting because it's known to regulate the complement system, and that has been shown to be deregulated in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, Looking for the cellular origin of this protein, we found it's only expressed in collagen expression cells. And there we, of course, detect different types of fibroblasts and uh, stromal cells. And it turns out, looking into single cell data, that uh, this uh, particular protein is only expressed in pericytes. And it's actually only expressed in pericytes from deceased patients. Performing gene gene correlation analysis within the pericytes we can uh, actually identify, so we correlate all the genes um, uh, uh, within uh, the parasites and then identify gene programs that are associated with the expression of this uh, protein biomarker here. And then we found uh, actually many uh, inflammatory uh, uh, related genes, including many chemokines. Enrichment analysis uh, within this program also shows that this uh, seems to be dr mostly driven by a STAT1 NF-kappa B uh, uh, inflammatory program. And one of the markers uh, that uh, showed up here is, uh, is this uh, somatostatin receptor here, which was interesting because it's also used for radio tracer imaging and it can actually detect uh, uh, zones of fibrosis in the patient. 
So we use this as a marker and validate it uh, indeed. Uh, we can see this SSTR2 positive pericytes only in disease. So uh, here we can distinguish uh, vascular smooth muscle cells from pericytes by looking into PDGF receptor beta and desmin co-expression. And then we have these desmin negative cells expressing SSTR2 in disease, but not in the controls. And this allowed us to actually uh, extend the study to many patients. So here we looked into 53 ILD patients, fibrosis patients compared to 26 controls and uh, used uh, uh, the stainings here to quantify the amount of that cell state and correlated to uh, fibrotic remodeling. So the Ashcroft score is showing the degree of fibrotic remodeling and you can nicely see that the appearance of this cell state correlates with disease progression. Uh, in the other example, <clears throat> so that's the opposite side, that protein is higher when you have a good lung function. Uh, we could see that, uh, so that's protein C attack one, it, it doesn't have any known function in the lung. However, it's, it's highest expressed in the lung uh, when we look into the human protein atlas. And in our single cell data, we can clearly see that it's mostly expressed in type two cells. So this effect in producing type two cells seem to be the main source in the human body for this protein. It's down-regulated in all three, independently in all three uh, single cell cohorts. It, uh, in, in independent bulk transcriptomic studies, we can see that it's down-regulated only in lung fibrosis, but not in other chronic lung diseases. And uh, looking again into this gene-to-gene -gene correlation, this time within the surfactant pro uh, protein C producing type two cells, uh, we find, uh, so here I'm showing you the, the correlation of C attack one, the protein biomarker to all the genes in the type two cells. And that's for the Chicago cohort, Nashville cohort, and in the color code, we show our cohort. So basically in the right upper uh, corner here, you have all the, protein uh, genes that uh, are co-expressed with CATEC1. And on the other side, you have anti-correlated genes. And actually the genes that are co-expressed are enriched for uh, surfactant production, cholesterol biosynthesis. So all the pathways that are known to be associated with a healthy, mature, differentiated 82 program. On the anti-correlated side, you can enrich, see enrichment for uh, inflammatory genes, exocellular matrix genes, intermediate filaments. So we interpret this as the early stage of a de-differentiation of the type two cell. And I have shown you in the first part of my presentation that uh, we, we sort of studied this process already in the mouse and also in human in the human data sets. So this is from all three cohorts. We can perform the pseudotime trajectory to these aberrant basaloid cells. And then we see the surfactant protein uh, genes going down and, uh, and I'm showing six marker genes here coming up and actually the same six genes, keratin eight, SOX4, tenistin C, fibronectin. So all of these genes are, are showing the same behavior in the mouse. So we think this might be a similar trajectory. And in, in, importantly, uh, the C attack one down regulation is preceding this process. So it seems to be a very early indicator of this uh, process, which we can also validate in uh, immunofluorescent stainings in, in the patients. So finally, when we want to use this as a biomarker, it would be good to detect it in plasma. Therefore, we I uh, had a look in two independent plasma proteomic cohorts. So we performed these uh, uh, mass spec analysis. And first of all, if you compare the, uh, in the, the plasma proteome with the bronchial velar lavage proteome, we can find many proteins that are detected in both plasma and uh, bronchial velar lavage. And we can look for proteins that have a higher abundance uh, in the bronchial velar lavage, so close to the diseased lung. So these are most likely locally produced in the lung. And indeed the CATEC1 protein is in this space. And we can also detect it in the plasma. And then uh, uh, luckily in the plasma, the, the correlation with lung function is the same. So it's positively correlated with lung function, indicating uh, that indeed, this seems to be a good biomarker for 82 cell health status in the lung. 
And it's very reassuring to see that also now in first uh, studies of plasma proteomes in COVID-19, this is, this is one of the top outliers that's actually down-regulated in severe cases of COVID-19. <laughs> So with this, uh, I want to summarize what I have shown you is that we discovered a novel transitional stem cell state in lung regeneration that persists in lung fibrosis. We can see reproducible changes in single cell gene expression and cell type frequencies across cohorts in, in, the, in the analysis. Protein biomarker signatures of lung function um, uh, 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 decline in pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, I've shown you how uh, multimodal data transfer can identify the cellular source of regulated protein signatures. And we discovered a novel activated parasite state uh, that features inflammatory and com complement regulators. And lastly, the c one protein is a novel biomarker for AD2 cell D differentiation in disease. So with this, I uh, would like to thank all the funders. Uh, and you for your attention, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Herbert, for this great talk. I'm sure there will be a lot of clapping if we were actually not in the virtual format. Um, so I can already see a couple of questions, but just to remind everybody, so if you do have some uh, questions, please either write them in the chat or raise your hand and then I can call your name. Um, let me start by asking you some questions, actually. So you showed very nicely that these CRT8 positive cells are derived by the AT2 and the club, right? But since you have the time series data, can you tell anything about the dynamics? Are they both generated or they both start uh, at the same time? Or is there some difference in terms of which starts first, which later? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So, uh, and actually we were um, quite puzzled to see that um, uh, dynamics indeed were different. So since we had these uh, many time points, we, we could kind of model the, the frequencies uh, in the time points. And it seems that the, um, uh, the alveolar derived process is sort of happening earlier and the airway uh, derived uh, was, was later. And that could actually make sense. So maybe since this is uh, this uh, bleomycin injury is very heterogeneous. So you, you can have zones in the lung that are very severely injured maybe you killed most of the 82 cells, right? And then the data would suggest that it takes a little bit longer to uh, first attract the distal airway stem cells. And then, so in the data, we indeed saw a difference in the kinetics there between these two populations. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So we have one question by Teodore uh, Capellos. So you can unmute yourself. Hi, Herbert. How are you doing? Hi. Hi. The question about, well, um, about your, ask you maybe to follow up a little bit on, on Boyan's question. Do you think a time context um, difference between the two trajectories or could it also have, or maybe have you also tested whether it has to do with the degree of um, dis destruction in the alveolar space? So have you perhaps tried other models like infection or other with different severities to compare whether you have one or the other uh, process being uh, switched on? Yeah, so indeed the hypothesis we had was that it's uh, local differences in the, in the severity, uh, but we didn't really, you know, test this systematically. Um, so since you mentioned other models, it's, it's very important actually to note that uh, the appearance of these cells is not specific to the bleomycin model. So in the paper, we also looked into other, uh, in, into other models. And then also in comparing our single cell data to other published studies, we could see that uh, most exciting was actually to see that in the plumonectomy model, which is completely different type of activation of these 82 cells. So here you remove one lobe, of the lung and then the, uh, basically the other lung is doing a, a kind of a hyper compensatory uh, growth. So you have uh, you have formation of new uh, scepter. Uh, so the 82 cell is becoming activated and it forms a new scepter. And also in this process, uh, the same, the, the 82 cells go through the same transitional state. And there, there's a very nice cell paper which shows uh, when you then have a mutation in the type two cell, 
uh, in this, this case, this was CDC42, a small GTPase um, knockout in the type two cells. Then uh, these cells, uh, uh, these mice get progressive fibrosis. Um, and actually that intermediate state that we discovered, it starts to accumulate and persist. So we, we compared the transcriptional profiles. We can see they are very similar. Um, and so this, this again indicates to us then this, that, that this is linked to the progressive fibrosis and the uh, accumulation of this cell type. Thank you. Um, okay, so I can ask you one more question before more people join, because I was curious um, for the lineage tracing that you did with the SOX2 and the SFTPC right so like the cells yes. um so i was wondering whether all of them become um the uh, krt8 or is it a subpopulation that um that turns into and if, if it's a subset of these cells have you any idea in terms of what actually pushes them to uh, to become this uh, different lineage now well, uh, so so when we did the SOX2, it's it's the whole airway, right? So and then of course it's just it's it's just a subset. So we we sort of counted out the um, uh, when they are already the differentiation intermediate. Then we can say okay, which percentage was from which lineage? Um, uh, it, I mean, if it comes to the signals that drive this whole process, so what we currently do, we use different types of uh, uh, computational analysis, including niche net uh, to, um, because we did also new experiments. We, we did the same on the, on the uh, mesenchymal side, this 18 time point sampling and bringing this together and really understand how the entire circuit sort of moves in time and there is these feedback connections where it's it's a little bit difficult to determine what's the actual origin uh -huh. okay. um, but we get actually many really interesting uh, candidates from this type of analysis that can be then tested in organoid models or we also use this precision cut lung slice uh, model where we can uh, perform perturbations and we have some success now in using this and also uh, coupling it to single cell readouts and then look whether certain um, uh, you know, uh, pathways are involved in these uh, transitions, but this is not very mature yet. So, mm. yeah. okay, we have one more question by Emmanuel Saliba. You can unmute yourself. Uh, hi, about you hear me? Hi, correctly? Yes, hi. Yes. Yes. A short question. Um, something maybe I missed, but in the blood, how early can you detect IPF in the process? Yeah, so I mean, the, the limitation of this study is, of course, that it was not a true longitudinal study. So we yeah. sort of uh, made use of uh, uh, many samples. And then uh, by correlating to the lung function, we have this sort of pseudo progression. And then we identify these biomarkers. And I think we have shown that by, by transferring it to this staged transcriptomic layer, that the biomarker signature we detect really correlates with disease progression. And now, so we have this prediction, which we would have now to address in a true longitudinal study. And there, then we can, I, I could answer your question in like, how early would we see this uh, to go up? But it's of course also always tricky to get the right type of samples here, right? Because in, yes. so already we started out with many samples that were at initial diagnosis. So they are sort of early anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. So um, I would like to thank you again, Herber, for this uh, very nice talk today. And thanks everybody for attending. Oh, wait, there's one more question by <laughs> late, late entry here. Um, so it's by Luca Tostis, so I'll just read it. Um, I might have missed this point, but have you guys tried to isolate these KRT8 cells and do some in vitro experiments with the in particular, maybe assess their potential to become fibroblast-like cells. Yes, so we are we are sort of in the process of uh, these ex experiments. So uh, I mean, we we didn't have a lineage label for these cells, so we have to uh, do this sort of by fax sorting. What what we can see already in this precision cut lung slices is that we can find certain treatments where we can actually induce these cells, and then they are still in this uh, kind of complex environment. But to get them out to a real kind of co co-culture system, 
we have to use fact sorting. And I should say, we are pretty sure that these cells never become something like a fibroblast. They just feature an EMT signature and this could actually explain um, claims that you have EMT in this process because people look only for specific markers that clearly go up in these cells. So if, if the if the epithelial cells start to express uh, ECM proteins such as fibronectin, uh, people said, okay, that's a EMT. But uh, in the single cell data modality, we can see they are not fibroblasts, right? So they they only different. It's only a different state of epithelial cells. So uh, to to answer the second part of that question, so so we think they have this EMT features, but they are not fibroblasts. Okay, and the last question is by John Tadros. Um, so the MEC5B variants underlie monogenic IPF risk in humans. Have you looked at how similar this MEC5B versus idiopathic IPF look in your models? Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the Mark 5 b um, oh. is genetically associated. Uh, so whether, the question is if we looked how similar I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, similar Mark 5 b versus idiopathic IPF. So, I mean, in the IPF patients, you have a genetic association uh, with uh, Mark 5 b SNPs. So, the Mark 5 b is not necessarily these club cells that we talked about in the mouse model. I mean, I guess the short answer is no, we didn't really look. Um, but I think this is anyway. Um, so, in IPF, maybe you have a a transformation of the alveolar epithelium into kind of a, um, a airway. So this is known as, as bronchiolization in IPF. So the alveolar epithelial states, they become more similar to, to airway states. And then ectopically, they start to uh, also get all these uh, normal airway identities, including these mucous cells and ciliated cells and so on. And so that's um, that could be one reason why this uh, Mark 5 b expression is sort of associated with with IPF, but I I don't I don't really know, and I don't know how this is related to what we described here. Okay, so thank you, Herbert, one more time, and thanks everybody thank for you. attending, and uh, hope to see you in about a month or so for the next installment in the lecture series. So have a good day, everybody. Bye. Ciao, everybody.